Hey team, welcome back to another Data Science 1 lecture. Uh, today we're going to pick up where we left off last time on neural networks and move from uh, the basic ideas to some more modern applications. Uh, so what, starting from, from where we left off last time, uh, thinking about uh, neural networks as these multi-layer perceptrons uh, that, that take in raw data and increasingly build more complex features on the way to some outputs. Um, we're going to talk about uh, how those ideas get, get transformed in, in some other use cases um, and how we can use them uh, both as, uh, as information processing tools to, to get outputs as well as looking at intermediate features and representations um, for, for some of our more traditional models as well. So the, the reason why I think this is, is such an interesting topic and, and one that, that I wanted to, to give you guys a flavor of in this class is that, that these deep learning methods um, have been uh, increasing the, the scope at which computers can interact with, with the world around them. Um, so from, uh, from previously when, when we had to you know, manually input data into, into computers to get them into any format that was recognizable, uh, the, the idea with deep learning is that you can take totally unstructured data and, and build your own uh, recognition systems out of them means that we can take in uh, things like images and, and provide sight to machines. We can take in things like text or, or speech um, and, and give, give them the ability to, to understand language uh, with robotic applications like the, the reinforcement learning stuff that we're not going to talk about in, in this class. Uh, you can think about haptic feedback and, and touch and movement. Um, and it, it's really just opening the, the scope at which, which machines can, can interact with the world and, and especially for our context to receive and, and understand data. Um, so I'm going to show just a couple examples of, of different ways that we can approach this to let us uh, better understand uh, complex data types and, and especially structured data, as, as we alluded to last time. Um, and uh, again, the, the intent here is not for you guys to come away with uh, you know, a, a specific uh, understanding of, of how these methods work. Um, and, and to be able to build your own algorithms. But uh, again, we're focusing on, on use cases and, and even more in today's lecture than in general. Um, this is just to, to give you a flavor of what's out there. And, and I expect that to be able to use these um, for, for your projects or, or for, for other uses, um, that you're gonna need to do some more digging yourself outside of class. Um, but hopefully get, this gets you started and, and at least knowing uh, where to look for, for those resources. So let's start with uh, the, the example that, that uh, we alluded to last time, which is image recognition or, or looking at its spatial applications. Um, so this is a, a use case where deep learning has seen uh, you know, incredible success and, and really popular use um, through, through lots of areas of application. Um, and you can imagine the, the data science applications of this being able to, to take in you know, raw and structured data like pictures um, of which really complex things are represented in different ways and to be able to turn those uh, into recognizable outputs that we can tag and, and use in all sorts of data science projects. So uh, the example here of, of Google Photos, you know, recognizing the, the content of, of some image you're uploading um, certainly opens the, the possibility of, of all sorts of uh, analyzation of uh, of the, the types of things you're taking pictures of or, or even the, the content within them. So the, the food example here, um, there's been data science projects that you know, try and estimate the total calorie count of, of the things that you're eating if you take a picture of each meal. Um, and uh, and you, you can uh, imagine lots of, of other uh, examples of inputs into problems that are, are images or pixels um, and that, that would be really hard to, uh, to, to automate pipelines for if, if we didn't have uh, good image recognition uh, software. Uh, this is, is something that's, that's used by a whole host of, of tech companies now um, for, for better or for worse. Um, so for example, uh, facial recognition is, is a huge thing in, in social media, but also in, in other um, kind of uh, surveillance settings like uh, security cameras. 
Uh, there's a you know really popular um, and and incredibly important uh, applications in in popular culture as well, and and deep learning has has really been uh, a, a mainstay the the last five or so years since since these developments came came around. Um, and, and I I want to stress though that uh, the the focus that we're going to talk about is on. Uh, passing in uh, pictures and, and images from cameras, uh, but all of the ideas that we're going to talk about today span uh, a whole host of, of different types of structured data. So for example, another type of structured data you might imagine is geospatial data. Um, so for example, uh, land use has lots of, of important outcomes um, for, for looking at, uh, at, at data science projects on, uh, in this case, watersheds. Uh, so, so we can imagine uh, that the the land use um, and and especially uh, the the relation to, to water um, has has been uh, an example of of something that's studied a lot here at UVM. Um, and and looking at you know upstream vegetation has impacts um, on on not only the use of natural resources um, but but also on water quality flowing through watershed. So so for example this this. Uh, uh, plot you see here is is a watershed modeled from um, from from Africa, but uh, we we've done uh, similar projects uh, closer to home as well. So uh, to to orient us here with the the lecture last time on artificial neural networks, um, we we had uh, had described these as uh, as models that took in a bunch of features and mapped those to uh, a number of other features like you see on the the bottom right here um, and the the uh, implicit assumption here is that any feature you input could affect any of the the outputs or, or the later features in your model um, and so so this uh, this feature that's that's often the case for multi-layer perceptrons is that they're fully connected um, which is to say you map everything to everything within each layer. And, and you can see that by the, the lines depicted in, in the image here. Um, and, and this gives lots of flexibility um, to, to be able to uh, infer uh, correlations between any one of your inputs to any one of, of your outputs or, or later features. Um, and, and gives the, the models a, a, an immense amount of uh, expressiveness uh, which is, is really useful when you're feeding in uh, especially engineered features in, into those outputs. Uh, but uh, when we start thinking about really big data, especially spatial data, uh, the, the raw number of inputs uh, be, become a huge problem in that uh, the, the example I have here where even a, a really low resolution camera, if you're trying to pull out, uh, let's say, 100 features from a, a 25, 256 by 256 uh, uh, image, then suddenly just in the first layer alone, you have six and a half million parameters, uh, which is not outside of the scope of, of what uh, gets trained in, in some neural networks these days, um, but requires a, a lot of data. And, and we're only talking about the, the first layer here. Um, so, so you can uh, imagine the case where uh, looking at dependencies of every single pixel to every single feature um, in, in the next layer, uh, becomes uh, really problematic just from a, a scale perspective. Uh, so one of the, the things that, that we'll try and, and do to, uh, to help resolve this problem um, is, is come up with a, a couple ideas um, that, uh, that, that I think relate specifically to, to spatial images here, uh, but, but we'll abstract a bit uh, later in the lecture. And the first is that uh, when we have spatially organized inputs, uh, an idea is that perhaps we only need to look locally to pull out spatially organized features. Um, so if you uh, you imagine um, you know a uh, a face detector and you're looking for uh, an, an eye, the pattern of pixels for an eye is. Uh, located uh, pretty specifically in, in just one part of the image. And, and if you're asking if there's an eye in the, the top right corner of your image, then looking at the pixels in the bottom left corner don't really tell you a, a whole lot. You really just care about looking at the, the features that are, are spatially located near uh, the, the detector that, that you want to be building. 
Um, and so uh, implicitly with a, with a fully connected neural network that takes in all of the pixels as inputs, you would be looking for dependencies across the image like that. So uh, just, just by looking at, uh, at inputs uh, locally, we can take you know, an input that's 256 by 256 and, and crunch it down into a, a 10 by 10 or a 3 by 3 or a 2 by 2. Um, and, and surprisingly small feature detectors um, actually turn out to, to work surprisingly well if you stack enough of them together and build more and more uh, spatially abstract features. Um, so, uh, so, so looking at, at, uh, at each part of the image, uh, layer by layer, eventually you end up um, with, uh, with detectors that, uh, that are asking if something is present in the whole image, because each layer you get, you get uh, spatially uh, slightly, slightly broader um, by, by looking at the, the pixels or features uh, around you in a neighborhood at, at, each, um, at each layer. Uh, a related idea is that uh, we can use the, the same uh, detectors for looking for the same features in different parts of the image. So again, this is, is unique to, uh, to structured data, where if we have a, an eye detector where we're looking for an eye in the top right corner of our image, if we are looking for an eye in the bottom left corner of our image, probably the the, the way that an eye looks uh, is agnostic of where it is in the picture that, that you happen to be um, you happen to be looking. And so we can uh, build detectors for these prototypical features and, and just uh, apply that same uh, little local detector um, spanning it uh, and sliding it across the, across the whole image. And so uh, as, as you can imagine here uh, by, uh, by uh, looking at, at smaller models and, and reusing them multiple places across the image, we're, we're starting to drastically cut down on the, the number of parameters we need. So uh, hopefully that made sense, but, but I think that, that this uh, comes across uh, most easily uh, in, in pictures. Uh, so so uh, let's take one step back from the, the 2D image and, and just imagine this as, as a 1D image, a, a line. Um, and let's say that line is made up of, of these nine pixels here. Uh, if you were to, uh, to try and uh, build a detector that, that looked at the, the whole span of your input um, and fed it into to some model that gave you an output, some function f of x, um, it, it pictorially might look something like this. Um, and, and for nine inputs, this, this looks pretty reasonable. Um, but uh, but you can imagine uh, the the difficulties as, as we scale up here. So the idea with convolution is to say we're uh, we're looking for prototypical features of uh, whatever is important to our image. Um, I, I used the example of of an eye detector for a face before, but as we mentioned last time, uh, what actually gets detected in each of these is. Uh, is the intermediate features that are found by training the neural, the neural network uh, through backpropagation. Um, and so, uh, so, so we, we don't really know what, uh, what these feature detectors are looking for. Um, we, we hope and, and we have some evidence that uh, it's finding useful things. Um, but, uh, but for now, just think of, of this little box A as our, our feature detector as, as a black box that's, that's pulling out uh, something about our image. And, and as you can see, we're applying the, the same exact um, uh, feature detector uh, at, at all instances. So while the, the pixels are different in that they have subscripts of, of x0 through x8, uh, this, this isn't uh, different versions of the feature detector, but, but literally the same exact one that's, that's tiled across all possible examples of, of two inputs next to each other, uh, which is to say we're looking at uh, a two pixel uh, local neighborhood. Um, that's the the size of our filter. Um, we, we often call these these feature detectors filters for uh, for image data. Now the the idea um, of of using the same one across all of these um, it cuts down dramatically. Uh, having to have you know an A one and A two and A three um, all, all the way to to A seven. Um, and uh, and and being able to to use the same model. Um, we, we often call weight sharing. Um, and, and this is the idea that the, the weights that are in the, the detector for X0 and X1 is, are the same weights that, that are in X7 and X8. And, and this is great because it reduces the, the number of 
um, of parameters we have in our, our whole model. Um, but, but it's also nice uh, in that uh, we've, we've now taken this one example of, of a single input and, and really actually turned it into, um, into what is this, uh, seven, eight, into eight uh, uh, unique inputs in that uh, you know, x0, x1 is used to train A. Um, and similarly, x1 and x2 is used as, a, as another piece of training data to, to help train A. And then uh, the, the x2, x3 combination is, is, is again fed into to that same filter. Um, and so, so you, can, you can imagine here how uh, not only are we reducing our, our total size of our, our network um, parameterization, which helps training, um, but we're, we're splitting the, the input from one big chunk into lots and lots of little chunks, and, and that actually kind of pseudo generates more uh, training data as well. So, so this weight sharing technique is, is great from a data efficiency perspective in, in both regards. Now, the, these, uh, these little feature detectors, uh, for our purposes, we can think of as, as totally black boxes, but the, the nice thing about them being a black box is that uh, if there, there's, uh, there's any um, function that, that we want to re represent, um, we, we can have that uh, within our black box. Uh, this is, a, is typically a, a single layer uh, neural network. Um, but uh, but you can imagine it being as as complex as you want, so long as uh, as it's differentiable. Um, so so think of these mostly as as mini neural networks. Um, but uh, but uh, the the idea of of this is, is agnostic of the model type. Um, so uh, this this idea of building uh, more and more abstract features uh, that. Uh, that are, are detected at, uh, at increasing uh, spatial ranges. Uh, you, you can see here as we stack uh, another layer on top of, of our, our, our prior layer, um, where we are, uh, are looking at, at the B uh, feature detector now. So uh, the, the B, uh, the, the most leftward uh, B detector, they're, they're not subscript. Um, you can see spans over, uh, you know, two instances of features coming out of a feature detector A, um, and so thus uh, the the data for for that particular uh, uh, um, location in the second layer actually comes from x zero, x one, and x two, um, and, and so you you can see how we're we're getting uh, more spatially abstract features as as we go up and up. Um, and and that's nice because you know you can imagine we we sometimes care about uh, more general features when we're looking at at uh, at, at uh, outcomes that, that have to do with our whole image. And it's also nice because uh, as you can see, we're we're kind of making a, a pyramid shape here, where the the more layers we get, um, the the smaller the spatial resolution of our um, of our, uh, our our values are at that point. Um, of, of what features exist. Um, and so uh, we, if we were to feed this now into uh, a, a fully connected model, um, you can see that, uh, that we just have you know, seven, um, seven features feeding into that instead of, instead of nine features feeding in. Um, so uh, eventually we do have to take uh, this, this data and, and, and pass it into some classification module, which is often a fully connected layer um, at the, the, the top of a, a convolutional neural network. Um, but the, the more layers we go, the, the smaller and smaller that, that input becomes. Um, and, uh, and there are, are lots of uh, other examples of, of ways that we can uh, make this even more extreme, uh, like putting in layers that, uh, that don't look for features, but just do uh, what we call max pooling that says, uh, you know, if, if a feature is present in either one of these, uh, say that we have it. Um, and that's, uh, as you can see, a really nice way to, to shrink scale quite quickly um, without actually adding uh, virtually any parameters uh, to, to your model. Um, so, so this model here, uh, you you might be able to to count the number of arrows has has fewer parameters than uh, than the the one before, um, and and is is easier to train and hopefully more uh, more uh, spatially robust as well.
uh, the example of just looking at, at two neighboring nodes um, for each filter or, or for each subsequent uh, feature detector um, is, uh, is a, a good example. But, but as I mentioned before, you can think of these at, at any filters of any varying scale. So here's an example of a, a picture of, of uh, filters of size three instead of size two. And you can imagine that the, the same idea exists here. Um, though uh, we're, uh, again, uh, narrowing in our, our pyramid and getting to smaller and smaller resolution um, feature values uh, quicker and quicker by, by using larger filters. Um, or, or similarly, by, by using uh, larger strides, which is, is how frequently we, uh, we, apply the, um, we, we, we apply the filters. Um, and, uh, and uh, another dimension which these can vary is whether we're, we're pulling out just one feature when we look at, uh, you know, in this case, X1, X2, and X3. Um, so in the, the face recognition example, you can think that you might not want to just be detecting eyes, but also have uh, another detector that's detecting uh, ears and, and one that's detecting a nose. Um, and, uh, and, and you can apply all of those um, through uh, through just one of these convolutions, um, if it has instead of one output, three outputs, or, or five outputs, or a hundred outputs, um, that uh, that that you still end up just taking the the procedure of taking this this little a feature detector and uh, and striding it over your image. Um, this is the 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 example of the strides I was talking about, which says uh, how frequently you you apply um, this feature detector over your image. Um, and, and you can see the example here where, uh, again, we're, we're very quickly reducing our, the resolution of our downstream layers um, by saying that, uh, that we're actually going to apply this you know, every uh, two input pixels instead of every one. So, so we no longer have uh, a feature detector that's looking at x1 and x2. Um, we're just considering each of those within, um, within their, their own little uh, couple here. Um, and, and you can imagine, you know, implications uh, both from parameter savings for larger strides, but also for, for missing some information if, if your stride is, is too large. Uh, so uh, hopefully that gives you some idea of, of the idea behind convolution. Um, and and I, I think it's, it's nice to see 2D, but uh, talking about images, the, these ideas apply, or sorry, it's, it's, it's uh, easiest in 1D, but talking about images, these ideas apply in 2D as well. Um, and, and you can uh, imagine uh, that uh, instead of the the uh, the two inputs leading to to one feature in in one D, now you have uh, using the same um, the same stride and the same filter length. Uh, if you're doing this in multiple dimensions, then the the number of features you have uh, and the number of parameters you have can kind of reduce exponentially here. Um, and so in, in this case with a, a two by two filter, we're taking four inputs and, and now turning them into to one feature. Um, and the, the same ideas that, that we had before apply here, um, where we're, we're hopefully uh, quickly converging um, from a, a really big and, and unwieldy input range um, into you know, lower and lower resolution um, uh, layers as, as we go. Um, until we have uh, just a handful of, you know, hopefully uh, uh, important features for for this uh, this type of input that we feed it into our model. Um, so to to return back to the example that I gave of the the two fifty six by two fifty six image um, with a uh, hundred fil a uh, hundred uh, channels, um, if we're uh, using a, a three by three filter. Um, that has uh, has ten parameters. So uh, each of the the nine inputs plus a, a bias input. We said last time we often include in in many neural networks. Um, and so uh, so now with uh, let's say sixty four channels, we have six hundred and forty parameters in that first layer um, versus uh, the the six point five million we had if if we had it fully connected. Um, so, so this is is great. Um, I'll, I'll say it's it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison because, um, as I said, we've we've changed the size of our our uh, our next layer uh, by doing this convolution, and and eventually we do have to have a fully connected layer on top. Um, so in the the example I gave, um, 
instead of uh, instead of uh, reducing with convolution, we were reducing down to uh, hundred features just with the, the fully connected layer. So there's there's downstream implications on the size of the network, but but I'll say that I think it's it's clear just how much uh, parameter savings is is possible with these uh, confnets. So uh, we we looked at uh, a simple example of this uh, in class um, and uh, and. To, to get into uh, the, the notion of actually implementing these, uh, the, the math behind them can get complicated. Um, and depending on, on how you're interacting with them, uh, you can look at, at packages that, that allow you to go into you know, more depth down into the details versus at, at a higher level, um, like we've been taking so far with scikit-learn. Um, of just treating these models as, as black boxes and saying, uh, you know, here's some data, please fit that model, uh, please predict the outputs from 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 this test set, um, and and Keras is a, is a great uh, package for for neural networks um, that that does the the same sort of thing um, with, with all sorts of so all sorts of um, of neural networks, including convolutional neural networks. Um, that uh, that that uh, abstracts some of these lower level languages and, and makes this pretty easy to use. Um, so if you're uh, you're uh, interested in in uh, doing any image recognition or, or or more complicated neural networks than the multi-layer perceptron for your projects, um, highly recommend checking them out. And, and as you can see, there's lots of uh, really simple tutorials um, that'll give you a framework for for getting started in problems like this. So uh, just to to wrap up the the um the the talk on uh confnets so these convolutional neural networks are uh great uh in that they uh use assumptions about the locality of features and the the repetition across uh big spatial inputs um to create uh models that are still uh stacked and hierarchical and, and really complex in, for for many of the reasons that we talked about with um with fully connected neural networks and, and multi-layer perceptrons um but uh but they they do so um with uh with, with far less features while still uh, allowing us to use tools like back propagation let us automatically find all of the the intermediate uh, features that are important, um, and uh, and and I didn't talk too much about the the other effects of of these convolutions, of, of which there, there are many implications. But maybe the the most important to mention here is that uh, that um, in addition to being able to train uh, on lots and lots of different um, different uh, inputs. Um, when, when we break down the, the full image into little little sections, um, it, it also uh, tends to help quite a bit with generalization um, to have all of these little local feature detectors that are doing the same thing. So, for example, if you were to to take the uh, handwritten digit uh, uh, recognition system and uh, and apply a, a multi-layer perceptron, uh, you would find the 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 mapping of all of those pixels to 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 the output, but if you were to do something like shift the pixel over by a or shift the the character over by a few pixels, or let's say flip it upside down, um, obviously none of the the content has changed, um, but uh, but the the actual locations um, and and which pixels are important for for recognizing which images change quite a bit, um, but by having uh, uh, having uh, detectors that just look at local information, you have the exact same line detector, um, you know, two pixels over as you did uh, in the, the spot where the original image was, um, because that, that filter is, is applied everywhere on the image. And, uh, and of course, it, it helps to have a, a representative training set. So, uh, you know, if, if you saw examples of, of images upside down, that would help. But even if you didn't, um, you know, uh, building up these these simple hierarchical representations like finding line detectors. Um, you know, hopefully a line looks the same um, or, or is, is easy to find if it's rotated or upside down um, compared to uh, to trying to pull out uh, correlations across the whole image at once. So that's that's kind of the the nice part of building this up uh, piece by piece. 
Um, some some cons of uh, of convolutional neural networks. Um, we've uh, we've mentioned uh, a little bit some attempts to try and figure out what the the features actually mean um, by uh, by looking at uh, at examples of images that that use them highly. Um, but uh, but this is a really hard thing to do. And, and in general, if you were to just uh, you know print out uh, the the features that are used. Um, by uh, by a, a network or the features that are learned when trying to process an image, uh, it's it's really hard to tell what's going on inside those, and so uh, it's it's best, especially for our purposes, to think of these as as totally black boxes where where we can't really get easily at the logic uh, of of what's going on inside them, um, which which can be frustrating if if you're trying to um, trying to, to show what important features are for, for some particular problem, which is, is something we've been able to do with things like uh, like uh, lasso models or, uh, or, or random forests. Um, another downside is that uh, while we have fewer parameters in convolutional neural networks than, um, than traditional neural networks, the, the fact that we still often input huge uh, images um, or, 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 or uh, High-dimensional um, uh, data inputs; uh, they th these models still end up having tons and tons of parameters, and, and it can take a lot of data to train them well. Um, uh, a little trick um, that, uh, that that we we uh, talked about in class is, is the idea of transfer learning, um, where you you try and learn some of the features, uh, especially the lower level features, um, on a, a separate data set, um, and and use those. Um, to uh, to to extract some of the the more uh, general features of of the data that you care about, and then you know really just using the the data that you have to train the the higher level layers, which uh, presumably are more task specific uh, features, um, and and oftentimes this works, um, but uh, again there are lots of uh, of caveats and, and tips and tricks with that too. Um, but if you're you're uh, using these uh, confnets for your your project, I, I would look up and, and do more reading on transfer learning for sure. So uh, let's uh, let's quickly talk about uh, a couple other examples. Um, the the text applications in natural language processing is is what I really wanted to highlight because it's uh, not only uh, seems to be of interest to a lot of folks in the, the class here, but I think is a, a very different approach about how you can use neural networks in in data science. So the idea here is is not so much um, to uh, to to look at um, to look at uh, using these networks for prediction, but to use them uh, to to design encodings. So when we introduced text in natural language processing before, we talked about a bag of words encodings that just uh, has a one hot vector to count uh, how many times each word was uh, was used in a, a corpus or or a data set. Um, and this is is really nice because it's uh, it's really simple and intuitive. And looking at the the count of words, you know, the the column for that feature is labeled by what that word is. So it's it's really easy to tell what's going on under the hood. Um, but uh, a, a big con that we talked about was the fact that uh, we we aren't uh, looking at the the meaning of any of these words or the relationships of words to each other. Um, and so uh, so we're we're losing a lot of the richness of of what makes language um, in interesting and in the, the structure that's there. Um, so the, uh, the, the idea here is to, to use word embeddings to try and find meaningful representations uh, uh, of words in, in some vector that's, uh, that's hopefully more informed than a, a one hot vector of you know, zeros everywhere except the column where that word is, that's, that's a one. So uh, we're going to uh, feed the text into uh, a neural network um, just as, as we would before. Um, and the, the, the details of, of getting your head around this are, are a little bit tricky um, because e each of these inputs is, is actually a, a one hot vector for that word. Um, but but uh, don't get too lost in the, the low level details here. Uh, the, the, the big idea is that uh, when we're processing uh, this information, going from from text inputs into you know something about uh, about that text that you're trying to predict, uh, if the model is is trained well, 
um, and and that propagation typically does a pretty good job of training these models. What well, you'll end up in the intermediate in the intermediate layers, like we talked about last time, are uh, embeddings or representations of uh, automatically found features that are uh, helpful or or important for this task. These are the the kind of most salient features, um, and you can imagine pulling out these representations. Um, at uh, at any level of granularity. So in the the example here, we've pulled out the the middle layer, which uh, says you know what's the the best uh, encoding in a, in a length three vector of the important features in in the word. So uh, I guess that's to say what are the the three most important dimensions uh, across which words vary. Um, but but you could also think about pulling the next layer, which would say you know what are the the two most important dimensions to to tie back to uh, to uh, our our unsupervised learning uh, lecture, that'd be like saying what's the what's the uh, second first and second principal components of the the variation across words, um, and and so uh, this this is nice in that we can fine tune um, just how large of a, a representation we end up finding for for our words. Uh, for for the most part, we we will actually uh, in this class never actually go about training these. Um, we're just going to pull uh, embeddings and representations that have already been found. So we don't have to worry too much about setting what the, the correct length of the representation is. Um, I think it's it's more important to, to intuit that, that this is the, uh, you know, nth dimensional uh, uh, representation that, that shows the, the n most important, uh, most important ways that, that these words can vary, which is to say, quote unquote, the, the features um, of, of, of these words. So uh, how how exactly does that work uh, in in practice? Uh, again, we're we're never going to have to train these ourselves, but I, I think it's uh, it's interesting to look at at how these embeddings get made. Um, and so to to do this, we need a bunch of words to input, and then uh, and then some predictive task um, that uh, that that relies on the meaning of of the words. Um, to be able to build a, a pipeline that has some important uh, embedding or representation partway through. And the, the, the simplest versions are, uh, for example, um, a, a, a fill in the blank or a, 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 a guess the context um, example. Um, and I, I actually uh, appear to have flipped the, the order here. So the uh, the the fill in the blank is the continuous bag of words. So we, we talked about uh, our our static bag of words before, or, or our, our you know, traditional bag of words. There's a, a a slightly more complicated version of this that that uses these word embeddings called a continuous bag of words. So instead of having a, a one hot vector, a one hot vector, uh, now we have uh, some feature representation of of arbitrary length. And the way that we train that is we take a, a sequence of text and we uh, we pull out one word and, and input as, as features the, the words around that. Um, and then uh, we ask the model to output what the, the missing word should have been. Um, and so because of this, you can imagine how we inherently need to have uh, some sort of process that uh, accounts for the, the meanings of the words, their relationships to each other, and, and what words we expect to appear in, in what order. Um, I, I again won't go into the the details uh, about all the implications here, uh, but it's just to say that uh, that that this is is a uh, some problem that uh, that relies on finding meaning and context of words um, to be able to to fill in that blank correctly. Um, and then the the skip gram model is uh, is a, a similar idea where we take a, a single word as input and ask. Uh, what uh, what words are likely to occur around it in in some uh, some instance of of a, a sentence or paragraph or, or some text? Um, so you can uh, you can look at, uh, at at both of these uh, as uh, pretty simple um, uh, problems or, or, or models that that we might want, that we might want to build, um, and yet you can uh, imagine how. Uh, the the task here would create a representation or embedding within that network to solve that task that relied on on some important features about the meaning of, of these words. Um, 
And so, uh, so, so looking at, at what sort of embeddings actually come out of this, I, I think is, is really interesting and, uh, and, and is one of the, the most fun part of, of the, the word embeddings. Um, so to, to be able to, uh, to guess what, uh, what the right missing word is, uh, especially when there are many possible missing words um, or, or many possible uh, surrounding context words uh, that, that might be uh, might be similar but but subtly different uh, what the the embedding learns to do uh, in essence is to give uh, fairly similar representations which is to say that, that fairly similar features uh, are present in words that that could easily be substituted for each other um, so, uh, so for example, uh, in this this sentence here, the the fill in the blank that uh, that ideally is that you know the cat sat on the mat. Um, you can imagine that uh, that stood on the mat or laid on the mat or, or even ran on the mat um, are uh, are words that that could easily be re replaced in here and with you know uh, enough text with uh, enough monkeys at typewriters. Uh, you would imagine that, uh, that 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 there would in fact be a sentence, uh, some training example in building this word embedding where where that sentence actually would be the 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 correct fill in the blank, um, and so because of that we we need to uh, to be able to predict uh, both of these as as being likely things of what the blank could be, and and that means that the the representations that we make for those two words are are very similar, at least in, in some of their dimensions. Um, and so, so the, the way that this word embedding gets shaped is, is thinking about all the different dimensions and ways in which words could, could vary and picking out the you know, n number of them that, uh, that, that most uh, represent relationships between similar words um, based off of their meaning or based off of their, their context. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be synonyms. It could be based off of you know what words just happen to be uh, be next to each other in in a whole bunch of text. Uh, so uh, with with that, uh, l let me just take a, a quick second to 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 look at examples of of what it is that uh, that these vectors end up making. So um, while while it's in general really hard to uh, to look at a, a vector. Um, and, and take uh, you know the, the raw numbers in whatever number of dimensions it is and, and figure out what that means for exactly the same reason that, that for all our neural network examples, figuring out uh, the meaning of feature embeddings is, is really hard. Um, what we can do is, is take those features and let's say uh, project them down into you know two or three dimensions and, and plot them. Um, this uh, th this plot here that's just looking at, at how tightly clustered they are together um, maybe isn't all that informative. Um, it's especially hard to read and, and there's there's not really much structure. But we can think about instead of doing uh, just uh, just projecting them into into some embedding space. So this is a, a TSNE space, but think of it similar to to a PCA um, in, in Spirit, where it's just looking at the the dimensions which they vary most. Uh, we, we can also do some tricks where we plot these onto specific dimensions um, that, uh, that that relate to to words. Um, so uh, so for example, um, if if we were to to look at just the right slice through that big word cloud, um, and, and we were to take uh, the the relationship between let's say uh, male and, and female words. Uh, th these are actually the uh, the the word embedding vectors plotted on on that uh, that that two D um, that the two D frame here, which is is gender versus what what appears to be royalty on the uh, the, the y axis, um, and, and you see some really interesting. Um, relationships here. So, for example, you know the the difference in this vector space between king and queen uh, is is about the same size and, and direction as the difference between man and woman, which is uh, again about the same between aunt and uncle or niece and nephew. And so, uh, presumably, what's happening here is that uh, the the embeddings uh, uh, are are representing some you know causal or meaningful relationship in in the way that they've organized the the features um, and in which they appear in in geometric space um, if uh, if 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 that's a, a, a little bit uh, complicated to absorb for now uh, 
try not to think too much about the math and, and just notice that that there are common relationships that are pulled out. So presumably that must mean that somehow um, they're they're finding some meaning or some general concepts um, in the the text. Um, and uh, a, a really cool implication of this is that, that we can uh, take these vectors and apply any of the, the, the mathy things we might want to do to vectors. Um, so most simply, we could just add and subtract them. Um, so if you, uh, you were to take the, the vector for king and subtract the vector for man and add the vector for women, uh, what you would get in the, the end result would be the, the vector or the embedding um, for queen. And, and so, uh, so the, the relationships um, actually, actually you know, make sense uh, across concepts here, um, which is, is a, a really kind of strange and funny thing, um, but, but, but really, really cool. Um, so, so let me just show you a, a couple examples um, of, uh, of cases where, where I think the, the outputs of this are, are really uh, entertaining and, uh, and give some allusion to the, the types of subtleties that uh, they come up um, within, uh, within uh, the, these word embeddings. So, so here's one where, again, there's uh, some relationship in the embedding space. Uh, in this case, the, the dimensions that we projected onto aren't labeled. Um, but but you can uh, you know clearly uh, think about the um, the relationship here uh, between uh, the, the cities and countries, um, but but also maybe you can imagine some relationships actually in the the ordering of the of the the countries um, uh, along the the y axis as well. Uh, but to to take um, to take this relationship and, and turn it into uh, an analogy. Um, Again, just like king and queen, we, we can uh, we can frame this by uh, going back to our, our SAT analogies um, and and uh, and the, uh, the the structure there to say that, that this uh, means here that the Rome is to Italy as, as Beijing is to China. Um, so so let's uh, look at some other fun examples. So the the one we saw before that uh, the king is to queen as man is to to woman. Um, and, and here we've we've included a, a set of a, a, a couple of words that are close to uh, to the solution. So um, this this uh, also is kind of helpful in knowing that the the word embedding is put you know woman and, and teenager and and girl you know closely together in in semantic space. Uh, here's a, another one: house is to roof as castle is to uh, you know dome or or turrets. Um, uh, again, you know, uh, re really interesting that, that uh, you know, just through reading uh, a bunch of, of random text on, I think in, in this example, it's, it's Google News um, or Google Books um, that, uh, that we find these relationships. Uh, knee is to leg as, as elbow is to arm. Uh, that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, to, to get into to some more uh, subtle examples, uh, China is to Taiwan as, as Russia um, is to, to Ukraine. Um, that's a, a a funny uh, funny relationship um, and and something you know may, maybe quite subtle and independent on uh, on usage um, really more so than than any you know meaning um, so it's it's funny that, that these come out of of just reading uh, you know books or, or news um, that, uh, that that this relates to to historical and, and current events um, and the, the the last one is is perhaps my favorite um, that. Uh, that, that love is to indifference as fear is to, to apathy or, or, or callousness um, or helplessness. Um, you, you can, you know, find uh, all, all sorts of, of relationships and, and uh, again, you know, read into them as, as much or as little as you want. Um, but uh, just, just the fact that, that these uh, relationships could potentially exist in, in this embedding space, which is just built by a whole bunch of fill in the blank problems. Um, is is I I think re really really cool and and it has made me really interested in in this type of natural language processing and in my own work. Um, uh, another uh, quick example: uh, Iraq is uh, Iraq minus violence is is Jordan. Um, animal humans minus minus animals is is ethics. And ethics is the, the the difference between humans and animals. I think that's that's really interesting. Uh, this one's funny that uh, a president minus its power is, is a prime minister. Um, that uh, a library without books is just a hall. 
um, or that uh, that it placed in this space the the stock market uh, as being a, a really similar term um, to a, a thermometer. Um, so uh, uh, again, these are you know ad hoc uh, examples that that take them as as anecdotes that they are. Um, but the the fact that, that we can find so many of these, and and I'm sure many many more, if you were to to look at some specific uh, example. Um, of which I, I'd suggest uh, playing around with some of these. Um, it, uh, it, it, it uh, you know, uh, give, gives me pause and, and makes me really interested in, in finding out exactly what and how is, is happening under the hood here. Um, so to, uh, to, to just wrap up the, the word embeddings, I know we're getting a, a little bit lengthy here, um, is uh, just to say that uh, that that uh, to actually build these requires a lot of fill in the blank problems, um, as you can imagine. To to kind of get the the general sense of all of these relationships that we've just mentioned can be captured. Um, so so that'd be a really hard thing in any of your problems and and uh, and projects to train these from scratch. Um, even if it's really simple to you know just take a sentence and pull out some words to to make a fill in the blank problem. Um, but uh, a nice thing about these word embeddings is that since the the actual fill in the blank problem that, that that we're training on doesn't really matter all that much, it's the the embedding that we're interested in. Um, you don't have to train a, a brand new word embedding model on your problem. You can use one that uh, is trained on some uh, huge data set on some huge supercomputer somewhere. Um, that uh, that that you know Google has pre-trained for you, um, and uh, and uh, hopefully the relationships between words um, have somewhat similar meanings between whichever text it is that, that you pull a model that's trained on um, versus uh, the the type of of words and, and usage that that you have in your problem, um, and and given that uh, across domains the way that we use words in in spoken or written language tends to be pretty similar. This this idea works really well and is is I think one of the the the, the best examples of, of really great transfer learning. Um, that the the features that are pulled out between different uh, different data sets um, really say a lot about about each other. Um, and so so you can uh, you know just grab these word embeddings, which will take a word and turn it into some long vector. And in that vector, you can use as however many the the you know hundred features that best represent that word, um, and and use that in your data frame for for input into any of the the models that we've talked about so far in this class that expect some feature vector um, or, or some list of features or some list of columns um, to uh, to to get to some output. Um, there are uh, lots of uh, examples of wrappers um, for, for natural language processing as well. Um, at the time of recording, Spacey is, isn't one I've used too much myself, but, uh, but I'm, I'm planning to, to get into it. So um, perhaps uh, we, can, we can both play around with it in the, the live demo for class. Um, some uh, pros and cons of, of word embeddings. Um, some, uh, some pros are that uh, we, we can find really interesting and meaningful relationships between words that go beyond the, the traditional bag of words um, into uh, what we might call the, the continuous bag of words or, or just uh, simply uh, word embeddings um, that, that rely on, on meaning and to varying degrees for different types of algorithms also context uh, around the words. Um, and the, the best part of all is that these embeddings are trained out of the box that, that you can just use them to transform your text into feature vectors. Um, while we've uh, anecdotally shown some of the relationships that, that can come out of this, it, it is in general, again, really hard to take the set of features and figure out exactly what the meaning is um, for, for any given word or, or which dimensions in, in features it's, it's representing. So uh, a big con of this, like, like uh, all of the neural network methods are uh, the, the model itself, you really have to treat just as a, a black box. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna fly through a couple slides on, on time series, because um, I, I know we're, we're way over time for, for what these lectures usually come out to. Um, so, so let me just say that, uh, that the ideas of convoluting over space for images, you can think of 
um, of these as not being, you know, pixel one, pixel two, pixel three, but time step one, time step two, time step three. And so, so these uh, ideas of convolutions all, uh, all apply here for, for time series data too. Um, but there, there's also other flavors of neural networks that you can use for time series. So for example, recurrent neural networks, uh, look at relationships over time by feeding in not only the features of your current input, but also the, the features that, that uh, come from the, the time step before. Um, and so it's a, a way of, of uh, incorporating past knowledge with, with, pro with uh, current knowledge or current inputs um, that let you uh, really easily look for, for patterns over time. Um, so, so think of this, you know, if, if you were to unroll this loop, uh, you can imagine it, you know, looking the same as, as the, the temporal inputs uh, over time, the, the way we had them represented in the, the slide previously, that again, just takes the, the same model and, uh, and, and inputs um, uh, the, the, the uh, different instances over time in a, in a weight sharing sort of way. Um, there is uh, a, a version, there are many versions of, of these recurrent neural networks. Uh, maybe the, the uh, most commonly used and, and I know is, is used uh, for, for some of the projects in this class um, is a, a long short-term memory module, um, which uh, is just a slightly more complicated neural network that lets you look, think about uh, uh, what you're remembering from your previous time step and, and what you're not in a slightly more context-dependent way. Uh, but the, the general idea here is the same. And, and just like before, you know, many uh, wrappers around, um, around neural network packages like Keras um, uh, include functionality for, for recurrent neural networks as well. Um, uh, so to, to wrap up uh, what, what is, I, I think, one of our longer lectures to date, so I, I apologize, um, convolutional neural networks are, are really great for spatial data. Word embeddings uh, can do phenomenal things with text. Um, recurrent neural networks are, are a great thing to look up, especially LSTMs uh, for looking at, at temporal data. Um, but uh, but the the idea behind introducing you to all of these is is not so much to to say that you know you now have these tools in your toolbox and go out and use them, um, but uh, but just to be aware of of the sorts of things that uh, that that go into these and, and hopefully having some understanding that can guide you as a, a place to to look up tutorials or, or resources of your own, um, and including you know classes uh, here at UVM on on deep learning. Um, so uh, the, the um, expectations of, of you being able to apply these immediately to your, your data science project um, certainly are, are, uh, are reasonable and, and limited. Um, but, but if you do want to try that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here for help. So just, uh, just let me know. Uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll close it off and say uh, hopefully this was interesting and, and piqued your interest in, in finding out more about the details of all of these. Um, but uh, but we'll we'll put a wrap on it for today and uh, and we'll see you next time in class. Thanks.